Zola Levitt Presents with Miles and Katherine Weiss. Messiah in the Passover. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. So we want to welcome you to this special program yes. on Passover. Yes, Passover, the, the crown jewel of the feasts, and really so important that the Hebrew calendar really begins with Passover. Right. It really starts the process the year. of the way we relate to God in the Moedim, mm -hmm. in the, the appointments with God. And uh, Passover is the story. I love the way you say that the blood delivered in the Old Testament delivers in the New. The Israelites were saved by the blood right. in the Old Testament, and you and I are saved by the blood through mm -hmm. Yeshua. Mm -hmm. They were saved from the bondage of Egypt, and yes. we're saved from our own personal bondage yes. to sin, exactly. and the deliverance is, is complete. Yeah, it is, and this, this particular feast has a way of awakening people to the reality of who Yeshua is, not only in his Jewish identity and the connection with Israel, but also in that personal way where we've had people at some of our seders actually come to faith. Mm -hmm. They hear this message, they see the connection, and it happens for them, and they become believers right there and during the mm -hmm. seder. It's, mm -hmm. it's marvelous to see that. You know, there's never, I never tire of talking about the power of the blood, yes. of the blood of Yeshua. Yeah. You know, we see what, the, what He did for a, for a whole nation. He yeah. made them a nation after mm -hmm. He delivered them. Exodus says, then they became a nation unto Him. Right. And same with us. Right. When we're delivered from sin, when right. we're delivered, uh, when we receive Him, yes. then we become a people, a priesthood, a holy nation exactly. unto our God. Yeah, we become a family together. Yes. And really, that's one of the pictures in this, is the family nature of the way God does things. He is a father and he has a family story here that he brings deliverance to. I'm thinking about how the, even in the, the, um, the way that the Passover was often celebrated, the head of the house would wear a kittle, a mm -hmm. white outfit, which is symbolic of the priestly garments. Right. Now, we, not, we don't always do that. Some people do, some people don't. But the reason to do that is because the, the dad is the head of the house, right. and our house, our home, is to be mm. a temple. It should mm. be a place of safety and of peace. And we really should be able to live because of Yeshua with that sense that those that enter into our house have a touch with that peace of God, right. and then there, the availability is there for anyone to say yes to the blood being applied to their hearts. Amazing. And so Amazing. Uh, it's, a, it's a seamless connection between the Old Testament and the New. So what we'd like to do is go to Zola, uh, giving us an overview of the Passover, and then we'll go from there to my teaching. So let's go to Zola. Passover is far and away the world's oldest festival. It's the first of the feasts that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, and it has been celebrated all that time through those millennia, through the the Inquisitions, the Crusades, the concentration camps, everywhere the Jews were, Passover was always celebrated. It's interesting when we look back to the slavery in Egypt because there was 400 years of silence during that slavery, and uh, in that time, God said nothing to His people, but at the end of it, there was a sudden blood sacrifice, the Lamb uh, of Egypt, and, and He emancipated the entire nation in a single night, a dramatic uh, event. Then uh, scripture came out, and prophets uh, preached, and kings uh, uh, ruled, and finally there was 400 more years of silence after the Old Testament, leading up to another great blood sacrifice, the coming of the Messiah. That, that should really have been a very great hint to Israel. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So, after another 400 year silence, the blood sacrifice of the Lamb again, whichever testament I read, old or new, I can say, the blood of the Lamb delivers me from bondage. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. 
Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. Our resource on this program, the Passover Package. In appreciation for your donation of $50 or more, you will receive the Miracle of Passover DVD. Before a live audience, Zola Levitt explains the significance of this feast and how the Messiah is revealed. You will also receive the companion booklet and teaching CD, plus the Messianic Passover Haggadah, which guides you through the Passover Seder step by step. Click or call and ask for the Passover package. Welcome to Passover, the crown jewel of the feasts of the Lord. You know, I grew up celebrating Passover. Catherine and I celebrated with our family. And in the past few years, we've been celebrating with large, with large groups of people who are interested in the Hebrew roots of the faith. And I know that's who you are. So today, we'll go through the elements of the Passover and take 4,000 years of history and tell it to you in about 20 minutes. I say that humorously because this story is to be told from generation to generation. In fact, the word to the Hebrew people is that we're to tell this story as if we were reliving it over and over again. Now, it's a story of deliverance. In the Old Testament, it's a story of the Israelites being delivered from the bondage of Egypt. And in the New Testament, after Yeshua, it's a story for you and I being delivered from the bondage to sin. And it's an incredible redemptive story that just really speaks about the heart of God and the fact that He makes a way for you and me to be delivered from our bondages. Now the word that came to the Israelites in Exodus 12 verses 5 through 8 is that they should take a lamb, a lamb without blemish, and keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will sacrifice it at twilight. They will take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses in which they will eat it. And they will eat it roasted with fire. They will eat it quickly with bitter herbs, and they will eat it in, in haste. And the word goes on to say that there's elements about this Passover, each of which speaks to the deliverance from Egypt, and also it points to the Messiah. Now, all the feasts have a historical, a prophetic, and a personal meaning. And my prayer for you today is that you will receive the personal meaning that is in this for you. Historical, because it's about Israel. Everything in the Bible, this is our family story. It's about Israel. Prophetic because it points to Yeshua. It points to the Messiah and His sacrifice for us. And it is personal because there are things that God wants to speak to you, even during this time we have together. He wants to speak to you about issues in your life or perhaps making a commitment, a fresh commitment or a new commitment to the Lamb of God. Now, this story is told through the Haggadah. The, the Haggadah is a beautiful book uh, given from generation to generation, door to door, generation to generation. And we tell the story. Haggadah actually means the telling. And from generation to generation, we tell this story about the deliverance from Egypt. The Passover meal or Seder, Seder means order. The Passover meal has within it elements, each of which speaks about a certain part of the deliverance process for us. Now, the Seder plate has on it these elements. There is the karpas, which is the hyssop. It's a picture, it's parsley here, but it's a picture of the hyssop that was used to put the, lamb, the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and the lintel of the house. There's a roasted lamb shank, which reminds us of the sacrifice of the lamb. There is maror, which is a bitter herb, in this case, uh, beet-flavored, beet-colored horseradish. And uh, people have called it uh, uh, Jewish antihistamine. If you take enough of that, it will clear up your sinuses and you'll be good to go. There is haroset, which is a mixture of honey and nuts and apples and wine or juice. And it's to look like and to seem to remind us of the mortar of the bricks that we had to make for Pharaoh when we were in bondage in Egypt. There's a little cup here with salt water in it. The salt water reminds us of the tears that were shed when we were in bondage, and maybe the tears that you feel when you are reminded of your sin or when you are currently going through something specific that God wants to touch, He wants to help you with, He wants to deliver you from. 
And finally, there is an egg here, a roasted egg. Now, the roasted egg is a controversial element to the Seder. It was added later on, uh, much after the time of, of Yeshua, and they, it said uh, parenthetically or uh, anecdotally, it said that the roasted egg reminds us of the burning of the temple and the loss of the temple, and so we mourn the temple. The fact is that it really has a connection with the fertility gods of Babylon, and I, for, for our, our satyrs, we don't even keep the egg there. It's controversial, but I show it to you to know, so you can know that it's part of a traditional Jewish ceremony. I like to tell people that uh, because it's related to the fertility goddesses, uh, the Easter bunny did not save you. It's the blood of the lamb that saves, and so we don't uh, celebrate the egg itself as a fertility symbol, to say the least. Now, one of the most important elements in the Passover Seder are the four cups of wine. I remember growing up and we, little kids would get a thimble full of wine and we would be passed out by around the third cup, which was great for the adults. But the four cups of wine each have a specific meaning. The first cup is the cup of sanctification, and it reminds us to be separated unto the Lord, reminds us of our separation, and brings us to the Lord uh, for that separation to Him and our time with Him. The second cup is fascinating because it's a cup of judgment. In many seders, the cup of judgment is not even drunk. We will just instead dip our finger in the cup of judgment, and as we drop a, uh, as we place one drop of wine on a plate, we will recite the names of the ten plagues that were brought to Pharaoh. Now, why did God visit plagues upon Pharaoh? Because Pharaoh called himself a god, and because there were ten gods, small g, who were the gods of Egypt. And so our god, the real god, was letting us know that he has authority over every god of Egypt. And so we recite the names of the gods, and we drop a drop of the wine onto a plate. Some people drink that cup, some people don't. But it is notable that for those of us who are believers in Yeshua, we know that we are not appointed to wrath. That speaks about the rapture, it speaks about deliverance, it speaks about a deliverance to come. And we're not appointed to judgment and to wrath. So some don't drink it, some do. The reality is that we are, do that in mourning. We don't do that in celebration over the, the pain and suffering that came to the Egyptians. What a fascinating reality that right there in the same geographical area, the Egyptians in Egypt, Mitzrayim, and the, the Jews in Goshen, the Jews were not subject to the plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians because God spared us. And it's a picture of the sparing that is going to come to all those who believe, to all those who are going to be in a house or with a heart that is covered by the blood. More on that in a moment. The third cup is the cup of redemption, and that is the most important and most amazing cup in the Passover Seder. The cup of redemption is the third cup, and it speaks about the time in the Passover meal, the so-called Last Supper, when Yeshua was with His disciples, and in Matthew 26, 26, He institutes what we now know as the communion. And the communion is related to this Passover meal. It's related to this family event. It was never intended to be a ritual. It was never intended to be a ceremony. It was always a family event, always a time when we were gathered with those that we love and we're the one who gave himself for us, said, take, eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood. More on that in a moment. Yeshua instituted the communion at a Passover meal. And that's what we see in this third cup, the cup of redemption. By the way, that cup of redemption is the same type of cup that a bridegroom would place before a bride when he was asking her to, to be married to him. When a bridegroom was interested in a young lady, he would bring, in Hebrew life, he would bring a cup, place it before her, and it was called the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption is the picture of the bridegroom and bride relationship that a young man could have with his, with his wife-to-be, but also, above all, that the bridegroom of heaven wants to have with you and for me. And how incredible is it that after the meal, when Yeshua came to the third cup, He instituted communion. He taught them about sacrifice. He told them that He would be the sacrifice, and He released this incredible teaching for us and said that whenever we would do this throughout history, the Seder would forever be changed, and whenever we took this cup, 
we would be reminded of his blood sacrifice. He instituted that. The fourth cup is the cup of praise. And at the end of this entire event, the disciples would go up and they would leave the house singing. And there's a praise that comes from rejoicing, knowing that God has delivered us from, is, from Egypt or has delivered us from the bondage to sin. When you think about Passover, think in terms of, for example, the 4th of July in America. I'm sure other nations have their own day of liberation. But King George was a, an oppressor, was a tyrant. The Americans got together, became Americans, and were delivered from the oppression of a monarchy. So it was back in the time of Moses. The Egyptians, and with the Pharaoh at the head, were op oppressing the Jewish people. And God had prophesied to Abraham that for 400 years the Jewish people would be in bondage, but then he would raise up a deliverer. And that deliverer came in the person of Moses. And so we see that deliverance is always available. God is waiting and working and getting ready to deliver us from the bondage to sin, or in the historical sense, the bondage to the Egyptian oppression. God raised up Moses, and we were delivered historically. Now, there's one more cup in the Passover Seder, and that is a cup that is set aside for Elijah the prophet. It's a fascinating cup because we Jewish people, from year to year, door to door, generation to generation, we say, the Elijah will come and he will announce the coming of the Messiah. And so when the Seder takes place, a young child will go out, look for Elijah, come back and report he's not here year after year after year. But remember, Yeshua said that if we had discerned John the Baptist, John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, we would know that Elijah had come because John came announcing the Messiah. He came saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That Lamb of God is also pictured in the matzah. And isn't it amazing that even today, in today's modern matzah-making facilities, we wind up with a piece of bread that is no, unleavened, leaven being a type of sin, an unleavened piece of bread that is striped and pierced. Hmm, sounds a lot like Isaiah 53, that he was pierced for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. And so this picture of Messiah is in the matzah itself, which is taken, and three whole pieces are placed in a matzah tash. Tash means pocket. And are placed in a matzah tash, and there are three layers of matzah in there. Now, some people say that that's about the priests and the Levites and the people. Maybe. Some people say that that's about the the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, maybe, but I believe that this is really a picture of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And why do I think so? Because every year in every family all around the world, the Father takes a middle piece, he takes out the middle piece of the matzah, he breaks it, wraps it in white linen, and buries it to become the afikomen, or that which comes after, or he who comes after. It's a Greek word, but that is wrapped in white linen, buried, and at the end of the service, the children go out to look for it. And whenever, whichever child finds it, brings it back to the head of the house, to the father, who ransoms it, redeems it, and gives the child a prize for bringing the afikomen to the Father. What a picture of Messiah. Who do we know who, of these three elements, the third, the middle one, the Son, was taken, broken, bruised, wrapped in white linen, buried in the earth, and brought back up out of the earth as our deliverer, presented before the Father, sinless, spotless, and, and sent as our deliverer. And so when we come with eyes of a child, and we see this one, Yeshua, and we recognize what he has done for us. We rejoice knowing that our deliverance has come, our deliverer has come. And this picture in the matzah is and can only be about Yeshua HaMashiach. It's such an incredible personal story. This entire story is the telling of this great desire that Yeshua had to eat with his brothers, 
to break bread and to drink this wine with him to symbolize the sacrifice that he would make. And the following day, he would go to the cross. And at the same time that the priest in the temple would say, Negmar, it is finished. Yeshua would, sta- would lay on the cross and say, Negmar, it is finished. And that's the finished work of the cross, the sacrifice of the Lord for you and for me. Now, every year, the Jewish people sing about Eliyahu, Hanavi, that, that he would come and announce the Messiah. And it's a mournful sound. Eliyahu, Hanavi, Eliyahu, Hatishbi, Eliyahu, 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 Hagiladi, Elijah, the Tishbite, Elijah, the prophet, Elijah, the Gileadite. And yet, he doesn't come bringing Messiah because Messiah has already come for you and for me. If you want to take these elements and symbolically take them to you and recognize that the blood that was spilled, the body that was broken, is all about Yeshua's sacrifice prophesied in Exodus 12 and fulfilled in the Brit Chadashah that God himself has become the lamb for you and for me. And when that blood is applied to the doorposts of your heart, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Your financial contributions to Zolid Levitt Ministries enable us to bring you our weekly television series, our monthly newsletter, and our website. But you may not know your gifts of funds also support other ministries that share the gospel here and in Israel through our To the Jew First Fund, Aiton Shishkoff, our man in Haifa, and the Good News Fund. We welcome your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries as we serve together until our Messiah returns. Shalu shalom Yerushalayim Shalu shalu shalom In the holy city of Jerusalem We will pray for peace Shalu shalom Passover, I never tire of the story of the power of the blood in God's redemption. You know, in 
in Luke, it says, Luke 22, 15, mm -hmm. it says that Jesus himself kept the Passover. It is such a powerful teaching for us to know that he kept it and he's going to keep it in the future. Mm. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before mm. I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it again until the kingdom of God is come. Wow. So he kept it in the Old Testament, right. he fulfilled it in the New Testament, yes. and we are going to eat Passover with Yeshua. Yeah. He's really instituting the family story, the bridal story, the story of redemption. Right. That's why the afikomen, this broken matzah, the second piece that's in the matzah tash, the matzah pocket, is so powerful because he, he is picturing that brokenness and the reality of him going into the grave, going into the earth, and being brought back up out of the earth for you and for me. In fact, when he breaks the bread and blesses it, he says a traditional prayer, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Now we say that every time we have a meal, and yet here he is telling us that he is that bread wow. from heaven, went into the earth, comes back out of the earth, and those of us who have the eyes of a child and the open heart of a child can see that and know that he is the afikomen, or he who comes later, that which comes after. Mm -hmm. He is coming back. Mm -hmm. And it's a, just a wonderful story. We, we are blessed to bring this to you, and we want to, again, remind you to, to look up, because your redemption draws nigh. Uh, the days are short. Jesus is coming again, and he's coming for you and for me. So let your heart not be troubled. Amen. Your redemption draws nigh. He is the one who is coming for you. Until we see you again, we always want to leave you with this prayerful thought. Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource on this program, the Passover Package. In appreciation for your donation of $50 or more, you will receive the Miracle of Passover DVD. Before a live audience, Zola Levitt explains the significance of this feast and how the Messiah is revealed. You will also receive the companion booklet and teaching CD, plus the Messianic Passover Haggadah, which guides you through the Passover Seder step by step. Click or call and ask for the Passover package. Also, please call toll-free or write to receive our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. It's absolutely free and contains insightful article and news commentary with a refreshing perspective you won't get from the mainstream media. The Levitt Letter is also available at levitt.com, along with current and archived TV programs, our national airing schedule. Please remember Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.